pray together. Lord, we bring everything that we are to you. We pray that you would open our ears to hear what you have to say to your church today. God, give us listening hearts. Father, I pray that from the oldest to the youngest, that today we would receive from you words of life and love and grace, that you would convict and comfort, that in every way, Lord, we would be drawn into your we would be drawn into your shade, drawn, un drawn under the shelter of your wings. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen, good morning, good morning. All right, all right, it's a little quiet this morning. Although I think I'm a little loud. Am I a little loud? Just a little bit? I'm always a little loud, but that's okay. I want to start out by showing you something. Check out my hand. Look at my pinky. Can you guys see my pinky finger and how it kind of goes up this way and then like goes sideways a little bit? It's, it's, it's crooked. Y'all see that? You see my, see my finger? See how it's crooked? A nine-year-old girl broke my finger. A nine-year-old girl broke my finger. See, I was in middle school. I think I was 13 or 14, and I was at my house, and, and my neighbor had a cousin who came over, this cousin who I've, my whole life now, I, I just hate her, you know, like, <laughs> she, not really, I don't hate her, but you know what I'm saying. This cousin came over, this little girl, this little nine-year-old girl, and we were playing uh, soccer in the backyard. Now, I didn't grow up playing soccer. I don't really know soccer that well. At least back then, I didn't know soccer at all. Y'all know I just finished coaching soccer. Uh, but back then, when I was 13 or 14, I had no idea about soccer. So we're in the backyard, and I'm the oldest, and I'm playing with all of these little kids. Soccer. And I said, I'll be the goalie. The goalie. I'll be the all-time goalie. So we had the goal set up, two trees, I think it was, and I'm back against the goal, and I'm ready. And then here comes this little girl, this little nine-year-old girl. And I'm telling you, I underestimated her ability to kick the ball. Seriously underestimated her ability to kick the ball hard. Really, really hard. And so here I am, 13, 14 years old, and I reach out to catch the ball, and that ball comes blazing fast. And as it comes in, my finger apparently was just a little bit in the wrong place. And when I went to catch the ball, snap, my pinky finger broke. My pinky finger broke, and you can see it to this day. A nine-year-old girl did what? Broke my finger. I love this time of year. Do you love this time of year? I love this time of year. I love that I get, it's, it's, it's like an excuse. I get to wear sweaters. I get to wear a flannel shirt, which I love. I mean, I love wearing flannel shirts. Y'all saw me with a hat on earlier. I'm, I don't know why I shaved my head, but I just did. My wife said she likes that look, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to shave it. So I said, all right. But I love this time of year. The downside is I think I'm looking more and more like a lumberjack. You know, I'm looking more with the beard and the, th you know, so I need to, I need to, I need to probably uh, question my, my, my sense of style. Don't laugh. It's not funny. I'm looking, I'm looking more and more like a lumberjack. But you know, this is also the time of year when I have to wear gloves. I have to wear gloves and, and, and I don't like wearing gloves. Do you know Why? Because every time I put on a glove, I feel uncomfortable. I feel a little pressure and a little bulge. Right here where my finger <laughs> curves out, I feel a little bit uncomfortable every single time I put gloves on. And I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. I don't like wearing gloves. But I have to wear gloves this time of year. Every time I put on a pair of gloves, I'm reminded that I'm broken. I'm reminded 
that that bone was never set correctly by whoever that dear old doctor was who never set my finger correctly. I'm reminded that I'm broken every time I put on gloves, and it's uncomfortable. I want you to think about that word, comfortable, because I think most of us just want to be what? Most of us just want to be comfortable, right? And right now, I'm uncomfortable because I'm wearing this glove on my hand. That's why I can't wait to take the gloves off, because when I do, instant relief. I mean, instant relief. I don't even feel it anymore. I'm relieved when I take the glove off. If you think about it, we all want relief. From whatever it is that makes us uncomfortable, we want relief. We want we want, the, we want, we want to experience this, this, this feeling of not having to feel our pain and our brokenness and our hurt. It's such a small thing, right? But, but, it, but it's uncomfortable. We spend a lot of time and we spend a lot of money and we spend a lot of effort and energy seeking to be comfortable. A lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money to be comfortable. We want life to be easy and smooth and pain-free. And we go through so many things to be comfortable. But I got something to tell you today, and God has something to tell you today. You want to hear what it is? Sometimes there are things that are worth getting uncomfortable for. Sometimes there are things that are worth getting uncomfortable for. Why do I still wear gloves? Why? Because it's cold, right? And so I make the choice whenever it's cold to put on the gloves to be a little bit uncomfortable because I don't want to (laughs) freeze, because I don't want to be cold. See, some things are worth getting uncomfortable for. That's the main message that God wants to teach us from the Bible today. So if you have a copy of God's Word, would you open up to Jonah chapter 4? We're going to read the last little section of Jonah. Jonah chapter 4, verses 5 through 11. So go ahead and open that up. Turn to it in your phone. Jonah chapter 4, verses 5 through 11. I'm going to read it. It's on the screen. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along right there. This is God's Word. Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a little booth for himself there, and he sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up quickly over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant, but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm. Everybody say worm. And that worm attacked the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, when the sun rose, God appointed not only the sun, but a scorching east wind from the desert, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint, and he asked, Jonah's like, just kill me now. It says he asked that he might die, and he said it's better for me to die than to live. Why? Because he's uncomfortable. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And Jonah said, yes, I do. (laughs) Yes, I do well to be angry. Angry enough to die, he says to God. In verse 10, And the Lord God said, Jonah, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, That great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right from their left. 
and also much cattle. That's where the book ends. It's a little uncomfortable, isn't it? That ending is a little uncomfortable. In verse 6, it says, The Lord God appointed a plant to save him from his what? Discomfort. The Lord God appointed a plant to save him from his what? From his discomfort. See, Jonah was hot. (laughs) He was hot in two ways. He was hot uh, physically, because he was in the, the, the desert, was, was coming down on, the, the sun was coming down, but he was also hot in another sense. He was hot emotionally. I say he was angry. Because why? Because he disagreed with what God had done in showing mercy to his enemies. And so Jonah was hot. He was hot metaphorically, and he was hot physically. And so Jonah finished preaching the good news uh, to Nineveh because God forced him to. And then he goes outside of the city, east of the city, and he sits down to watch. What do you think he's sitting there waiting for? He's hoping that God will change his mind. He's hoping that God will change his mind and not show mercy. He's hoping that God will change his mind and send fire and brimstone down on the city of Nineveh. Fire from heaven would come down and destroy these wicked and evil people. That's what he's sitting there. That's what he's waiting for. And he's hot. He's hot. Have you ever been hot? Emotionally? Physically? But the hours passed. The hours went on. And and Jonah was the only one experiencing fire and brimstone. He was the only one sweating at this point. Nineveh was safe and sound under the shade of God's grace. The the punishment that God said He would do, He relented. He didn't do it. God had mercy on these people. So Jonah, he's like, I'm going to wait longer. So he's hot. So he grabs some some sticks or something and he builds himself a little teepee. Anybody ever done that? Build yourself a little teepee outside? I know my kids have done that before. Build a little shelter and he gets under there and he's kind of like, man, it's still hot. I'm in the shade. And that's when God, that's when God appoints and, 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 and provides a plant. And it says the Lord God appointed a plant to save him from his discomfort. Here's the irony. That word discomfort is a play on words. It's a play on words because it can also mean evil. Discomfort can also mean evil. And so you could think of this as God is saving him from his evil. He's saving him from his discomfort by providing shade, literally. And God is beginning to teach Jonah a lesson right here. God is providing Jonah shade to save him from his evil heart. Because he's bitter, and he's cold, and he's loveless, and he doesn't want to show mercy to those people out there who don't deserve it. I mean, the the sermon last week was all about that. All about that was such a good exposition of the beginning of this chapter. That we don't want to give grace to nobody that doesn't deserve it. And what are, we, what are we missing? We're missing that God wants to save us from our discomfort, from our evil. And so God provided a plant to give Jonah shade. But you know what? It was a setup. <laughs> it, was, it was a divine setup. Because next, in verse 7 and 8, it says, God appointed a worm. God appointed a worm to come and to eat that plant. God appointed a scorching east wind, which means it came from the desert, which was to the east. A desert storm, a desert wind was coming in to what? To take away the comfort, to take away the shade. Why? Why would God provide shade Make us comfortable and then take it away. Have you ever experienced that? Where God brings some relief into your life and you say, thank you God, and then all of a sudden. 
a worm comes in and destroys it. Something worse, a scorching east wind comes into your life and, 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 and makes your situation more uncomfortable. Here's what God wants to say to us this morning. Some things are worth getting uncomfortable for. Some things are worth getting uncomfortable for. See, Jonah doesn't have a clue what his real problem is. He doesn't have a clue what his real problem is. He's hot. He's uncomfortable. But the real problem is what? It's inside of him. His real problem is his heart. And he doesn't see it, y'all. He doesn't see it. And so God, in removing the shade, is actually pursuing Jonah's heart. What made him uncomfortable was the very thing that God was using to shine a spotlight on his broken and sinful and evil heart. God was using the discomfort of that moment to draw him out, to show him, this is your real issue, Jonah. It's rebuke, but it's loving rebuke. You know, discipline never feels comfortable at the time. But what God is doing is He's, he's using it to, 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 to help you see your issue, to help you see your problem, to help you see the evil that's in you, the, discom- the, the discomfort and the evil that's really inside of you. God wants to reveal it. This was God's way of waking up Jonah's spirit. Because brothers and sisters, sometimes we need to be stripped of our comfort so that we can see our real problem. Sometimes we need to be stripped of our comfort so that God can press into our hearts and show us what's really going on. God comes to Jonah in his anger And he says this, he says, do you do well to be angry for this plant? (laughs) Jonah, is this okay? What's happening right now? Are you you right to be angry for this plant? What does Jonah say? Probably something I can't say from the pulpit. But he says, yes, I'm angry. Yes, I'm angry. You know what? This is actually the second time that God asked him this question. This time it's about the plant. The first time, you know what it was about? It was about Nineveh. And about how Nineveh turned from sin and they repented and they told God we're sorry. And they said we're going to stop doing the evil things that we're doing. And Jonah was angry about it. Because he didn't want them to receive God's mercy. And so God says, did you do well to be, in verse 4, chapter 4, verse 4, he says, did you do, do you do well to be angry about Nineveh? And now he's saying, do you do well to be angry about this worm? And then God breaks it down. God says, Jonah, Jonah, wake up, brother. You pity this plant that, that brought you relief. I get it. But you didn't do anything to get this plant here. You didn't do anything. You didn't plant it. You didn't cultivate it. It just showed up and it, was here, it wasn't here yesterday and it was here today and it's gone today. And you're angry? Jonah, here's a city. Look, right there. Here's a city with 120,000 people. 120,000 people. A huge city. And he says, they don't know their right from their left. What does that mean? It means they're morally and spiritually lost. It means that they're headed straight for hell. And God says, should I not have compassion on them? You care more about this plant and this worm than you care about 120,000 people. You care more about your momentary comfort than you care about the lives, the eternal lives of countless people. God is saying to Jonah, wake up. He's breaking it down for him. 
And he says, should I, the God of compassion, the God who rescued you from the belly of the fish, should I not have compassion on all of these people? And then it gets uncomfortable even more because God ends it. He says, should I not show compassion for all these people and also much cattle? He said, here's a city that I've shown mercy and grace to and you don't even care. You care more about your comfort than you care about all of these people. Brothers and sisters, some things are worth getting uncomfortable for. Did you know Jonah is the one who wrote this letter, who wrote this book? Years later, he he wrote this down, and he's the one that left it hanging at the end. Jonah, as he, I believe, learned his lesson. Because why would he write this story if he didn't learn his lesson? Amen? (laughs) There's hope for us. There's hope for Jonah. There's hope for us. But he's the one that left it hanging. Why? Why does he leave it hanging at the end? I think he left it hanging Because Jonah and God wants you and me to ask the question of our own lives. Should I not show compassion, God says, on your city? Should I not show compassion? Yes, it means you're going to be uncomfortable. Yes, it means you're going to have to go into places that you didn't want to have to go. But God says to us, Should I not show compassion on a people who don't know their right hand from their left hand? God wants us to take this cliffhanger and to press it into our hearts. God wants you to stop focusing on your own comfort in order to seek the comfort of other people. Not physically, only. But spiritually, people who don't know their right from their left. Do we live in a world of people who don't know their right from their left? Can I get an amen? Do we live in a city of people who don't know their right from their left? We got together a few weeks ago to talk about vision. And, 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 and that's what someone said. We need, uh, we, Jerome actually, I'll call him out. He said, Jerome said, we live in a city where people... Uh, need to be reprogrammed, re-engineered. And we don't know our left from our right, and we're, and, we're, and we're toiling in this life apart from God. And God says, I have compassion on Orangeburg. God says, I have compassion on this city that people want to run away from. And God says, I have compassion right here. It's 100,000 people. Well, 90,000 people in the county, who don't know their left from their right. And so how, the question is, okay, how can we develop compassion when life is hard and uncomfortable? Because I know that many of you have been working on this. Many of you have been seeking to love your neighbors. And it's uncomfortable, right? It's hard. It's disappointing, You're like me with the glove on, you know? You just want to take it off and be comfortable for once. I get it. God gets it. But some things, God says, are worth getting uncomfortable for. And so, amen. So I have three points of application for you now. How can we develop compassion for the lost? All right? How can we develop compassion for the lost? Number one, get motivated. Get motivated by the discomfort of Jesus. Get motivated by the discomfort of Jesus. Look at Jesus. Y'all, look, if you get nothing else out of this message, get motivated by the discomfort of Jesus because Jesus is the greater Jonah. You see, Jonah sat east of Nineveh and wept over himself. And in the last week of his life, Jesus stood east of Jerusalem and wept over the people who were lost. There's a contrast here between Jonah weeping over his own little pitiful problems 
And Jesus, the Son of God, weeping over Jerusalem, weeping over the lost, weeping over those who would crucify Him. And so we need to get motivated by the discomfort of Jesus Because your salvation, the forgiveness of your sins, your liberation from death, your eternal life took Jesus' discomfort. The Bible says that He lived in the comfort of heaven, but He gave it up to come to earth. He came to earth to be born as a man, to be born under the misery of life. Jesus was not born with a silver spoon in His life. No, He was born in a born in a backwoods town and laid in a borrowed cradle where they feed, feed animals in a manger. That's what, We're going into Christmas. But, but don't let all the lights and the glitter and everything confuse you. Christmas sucked for Jesus and his little family. It was, it was rough. They couldn't even find a place to stay. He was born in the mud. None of you were born in the mud. Jesus was born in the mud. He entered into the mess. He took on our human nature, complete with all of its fragility and its suffering and all the things that we deal with, the temptations. He put himself under the law. Do you hate the speed limit? Yeah, I do too. That's because you're under the law. Do you hate it when your parents tell you what to do? Yes, I do too. And you know why? Because we're under the law. Jesus was born under the law. He was born under the law. He was born in all kinds of discomfort. Poverty. Rejection. At some point, a single mom having to struggle to make ends meet. Not to mention the temptation, the constant temptation to turn away from his Father's will. And the glory of Jesus is that he took on all of that discomfort, every disadvantage he took on himself, and he was holy, holy, holy. He took on every disadvantage, and he was righteous. He never sinned. He never did what we do. He never dishonored his parents, as we mentioned before. He never looked at a woman with lust. He never, uh, uh, he never murdered anyone in his heart. Even his enemies who deserved it, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. J- read about Jesus and get motivated by his discomfort. He got discomfortable. Uh, Discomfortable? Uncomfortable. (laughs) Amen. He got uncomfortable so that you can be comfortable. He took the hellfire and brimstone of God's wrath on the cross so that you could receive the mercy of God's shade. Jesus is the greater Jonah, and he did it for you, and he did it for me. He got uncomfortable so that we can be brought into the eternal shade of God's grace. And not just you, but other people. 90,000 people who don't know their left from their right, who live confused lives. God wants you to get uncomfortable so that they can get comfortable. Does that make sense? God wants you to get uncomfortable, and me so that they can be comfortable. Number one, get motivated by the discomfort of Jesus. Number two, pay attention. This is easy to apply, but easy to forget. Pay attention to the discomfort in your life. Little things like this. Pay attention to the discomfort in your life. Now, paying attention is hard. Uh, Sometimes I'll be sitting in the den and Laurie uh, will come to me uh, frustrated and she'll say, did you help Isaiah with his math homework? And I'm like, whoa, back off, girl. Like, what's going on? And And she's like, he just came and asked you like five times if you would help him with his math homework. And I'm like, I didn't hear him ask me. Like, he asked me? I didn't hear it. I didn't hear that. I wasn't paying attention. Now, some of you might be like me. It's hard to get your attention. Uh, My wife and my kids have learned that they have to make me uncomfortable (laughs) to get my attention. They have to like 
wave their hands in front of my face, like tap on my shoulder repeatedly until I just listen. They have to like throw cold water on me. No, don't do that. Don't do that. But they have to get my attention. It's pathetic, I know. (laughs) What does it take for God to get your attention? Maybe you're like me, sitting there zoning out in life, and God's like... God had to get Jonah's attention. (laughs) He sent a storm. That didn't do it. He sent a great fish. That didn't do it. He rescued him from the belly of the fish after three days of near-death experience. That didn't do it. He gave him unprecedented success in ministry. That didn't do it. It wasn't until Jonah got hot and sweaty and God gave him the shade and then took it away That he woke up. He woke up and he finally got it, I believe. He finally got it. God finally got his attention. What does God have to do to get your attention? Let me suggest that you pay attention to the discomfort in your life. That wherever you are discomfortable, uh, discomfort, wherever you are uncomfortable, English is such a weird language. Wherever you are uncomfortable, even in the little things, okay, even like this. When I'm uncomfortable wearing gloves, I need to remember God's trying to get my attention. Because God has compassion for 90,000 people out here. And he's, he's shown me in his own life through Christ what it looks like to really be uncomfortable for the sake of loving and bringing grace to a whole world. <laughs> And God has called you, brothers and sisters. Are you, does it make you uncomfortable? What makes you uncomfortable? Lean into that. That's my third point. Lean into that. This is where God wants to work. Wherever you feel uncomfortable, is it with your image? Does that make you uncomfortable looking in the mirror? Is it, is it, is it at school? Being called on to answer a question, uh, I'm uncomfortable. Is it having a conversation with a stranger? Is it walking over to your neighbor to, to, to ask them, how can I serve you? How can I get to know you? How can I pray for you? Is it talking to someone of a different cultural background or ethnicity? Does that make you uncomfortable? Is it fumbling over the words of the good news of Jesus, like I don't really know what to say? Does that make you uncomfortable? Does it make you uncomfortable to bring up um, the, the, the sins of others, especially your children, and say, let me tell you where you're falling short? Or your friend and, and, and entering in to that discomfort? That's what God wants us to do. So wherever you feel dis- un- discomfortable, wherever you feel uncomfortable, lean into that. Because that's exactly where God wants to use you to bring grace to other people. Wherever that discomfort is felt, that is where God wants to use you. So God wants to say to you and to me, lean into the discomfort. Lean into the discomfort for the sake of other people who don't know their left from their right, who need you. They don't need you. They need you. They need God. And most people think God is so distant, and God has sent you, brothers and sisters, into this world, into this community, to be a shade of grace to people. But we gotta, we got to be willing to get uncomfortable. we got to be willing to experience some discomfort and to lean into that, and to not always be pulling the glove off to get comfortable. we got to be willing. And look, I'm preaching to myself here, okay? I don't want to walk over to my neighbor's house and have a conversation. But God is calling us into that. God, the person I'm working with who I know is struggling with something, can I offer to pray for them? Just bringing the light of God, bringing the grace of God into the situations of life where we feel, dis- un- where we feel discomfort, where we feel uncomfortable. God is calling you into that. Let's be willing to get physically and emotionally uncomfortable so that God can use us to bring spiritual comfort to other people. 
Some things are worth getting uncomfortable for. This story that Jonah shares with us about his life, his failure, it convicts us that so often we are more concerned with our tribe, more concerned with our political party, more concerned with our uh, fraternity and sorority, our school, our church, our this, our that, our family, than we are with other people. And God wants us to enjoy those things, but be willing to lean into the discomfort for the sake of other people. Let's pray together. God, we bring you our discomfort. We confess to you the ways that we seek to just be comfortable. But God, I pray that you would bring worms and scorching east winds into our lives so that we would be revealed for what we really are and so that we could know where we need to turn from our self selfishness and turn from our own evil hearts that just want good for us and nobody else. God, I pray that this church would have a willingness to be uncomfortable in order to bring life and grace and shade to this community that needs it so bad. God, help us. Remind us of the discomfort of Jesus and renew our faith in Him, the one who was uncomfortable so that we could be comforted. God, wake us up to the areas of our life where we do feel uncomfortable and help us to lean into that, to lean into that for the sake of other people, to trust you enough to get uncomfortable. God, help us with that. I pray that for myself. I pray that for everyone here or who's listening online. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.